Hello and welcome to another virtual session of Sunday School or Bible Study at Hernando, Florida Church of the Nazarene. I am Charles Siebold, one of the adult teachers. We have had some excellent lessons from our rotation of teachers and have received some good uh, positive uh, feedback from you. During the month of August, we shall have one or two new teachers joining our rotation, and we look forward to hearing them. Some of the suggested lessons uh, for this summer quarter are from the book of Psalms, a book that no doubt that you have read through many times in your life or that you have referred to very often. Today I wish to explore with you Psalm 15 and Psalm 1. Yes, in that order, 15 and then 1. But first, allow me to make some general comments about the book of uh, Psalms. If you uh, lay your Bible down and kind of uh, uh, look to the very center of your Bible and open it, it will probably open to the book of Psalms. This is a great collection of songs and prayers that express the heart and soul of humanity. Since they are songs and prayers, we do not normally reference the Psalms by chapter, but by stating Psalm and then the number that we are referring to. In them, we find the whole range of human experiences expressed. You have probably seen those lists that tell you that when you are experiencing uh, such and such, refer to a particular psalm. The book holds no cliches or just simple uh, advice that um, is that contains no depth. Instead, David and the other writers honestly poured out their true feelings, reflecting a dynamic, powerful, and life-changing friendship with God. The psalmists confessed their sins, expressed their doubts and fears, asked God for help, excuse me, <clears throat> and asked God for help in times of trouble, and also praise and worship him. As you read the book of Psalms, you will hear believers uh, crying out from the depths of despair, and you will hear them singing their songs of celebration. <clears throat> but whether the psalm writers are despairing or rejoicing, you will always hear them sharing honest feelings with their God. Because of the honesty expressed by these writers, men and women throughout history have come again and again to the book of Psalms for comfort during times of struggle and distress. And through the Psalms, they have risen from the depths of despair to new heights of joy and praise as they've discovered the power of God's everlasting love and forgiveness. So let the honesty of the Psalms guide you into a deep and genuine relationship with God. Of the 150 Psalms, King David is said to have written 73 of those Psalms. 51 are anonymous and others are written by uh, other uh, uh, individuals that are indicated in the book itself. The key verse is perhaps the very last verse, Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Some of the psalms are very short, as in the case today, and some are very long, such as Psalm 119, having 176 verses. Can you imagine a church worship leader 
asking the congregation to stand and sing or recite all 176 verses of a song or a poem. Let us now look at the two psalms that I mentioned, Psalm 15 and Psalm 1. They are similar in theme, Psalm 15 calling us to godly or righteous living, while Psalm 1 addressing the fruit of the righteous or godly living. So it seemed to me uh, in my logic or way of thinking that Psalm 15 might, we might want to precede Psalm 1 since we are pairing them today. Let me read Psalm 15 to you. There are only five verses and it is listed as a Psalm of David. Verse 1. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill? He who walk, whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be forsaken, or excuse me, will never be shaken, is the word shaken. Okay, let's look at that psalm a little bit, uh, verse by verse. Again, only five verses. And you may have noted that verse 1 asks uh, two questions. Actually, they're the same question as stated two different ways. And then verses 2 through 5 are the answers to that question. Then finally, verse 6 is a promise that we all can accept from God himself. Verse 1 says, Who may dwell in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may live on your holy hill? Sanctuary and holy hill are interchangeable words describing the focal point of Israelite worship, the dwelling place of God. That could have been the um, tabernacle that moved from place to place as the Israelites uh, moved, and uh, especially on their journey from Egypt to Canaan. Or it could have meant the uh, Temple of Solomon that was built later. For the Psalms do cover approximately all 900 years of history. For one, at least some of the Psalms are attributed to Moses himself. So verse 1 is a rhetorical reminder of the holiness of God. In a church culture that sometimes seems to turn God into a tame, domesticated, quote, teddy bear, unquote, God, we would do well to remember this as the all-powerful creator God who spoke the universe into existence, miraculously redeemed his people out of Egypt, and takes sin seriously. So the question is, who may dwell in God's sanctuary? Who may live on God's holy hill? Or who has a right to relationship with God. Well, verse 1 and the following verses give us uh, some answers to that question. God calls his people to be morally upright, and in this psalm, he gives us 10 standards. I'll not enumerate those, so that's kind of, maybe you can dig those out yourself. There are five positive and five negative 
standards that he gives us to determine how we are doing. We know that we live among evil people whose standards and morals are continually eroding. Our standards for living should not come, though, from our evil society, but from God. Verses 2 through 5, as we grow in our relationship with our Redeemer, we develop a desire to live by His standards. The depth of our eternal relationship with Him can often be measured by the way we, re we reflect His standards in our daily activities. Verses 3 and 4 uh, say something to us about our speech, our tongue. And we know that words are powerful and how we use them reflects on our relationship with God. Perhaps nothing so identifies Christians as their ability to control their speech, speaking the truth, or as Paul said it in one of his New Testament writings, speaking the truth in love, refusing to slander, and keeping oaths or keeping promises. Watch what you say. We, Our good pastor recently uh, took us through the book of James, and James had a lot to say about controlling our tongue. Verse 5 talks about the lending of money, charging interest, and so forth. God was against the Jews charging interest or making a profit on loans to the needy or to fellow Jews. This was expressed in the early uh, writings of the Pentateuch, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus. Although charging interest on loans to foreigners was allowed in Deuteronomy 23.20, interest was also permitted for business purposes as long as it was not exorbitant. The promise, verse 6, as I mentioned, says that the faithful will never be shaken, does not mean Bad things will not happen because we know that it rains on the just and the unjust. Bad things do happen to godly people. But what it means is that circumstances do not have the power to shake our relationship with the Lord, both personally and as the body of Christ or the church. It means the person of true piety whose alliance is true, whose words are restrained, and whose dealings are righteous, will stand fast. Nothing can move him or her. So, in Psalm 15, we've had the question, and we've had the answer. And, in effect... It is a call to all of us for godly living. Now let's turn back to Psalm 1. It also has only six verses. And it is a psalm that uh, at least I have often read and enjoy, especially some of the very descriptive words that are contained in it. It starts with the word blessed. Are you blessed today? I had a friend, or I have a friend, who anytime you ask him, how are you doing? He says, I am blessed. And we, as God's children, definitely are a blessed people. Sometimes that word is pronounced blessed. I always heard it, especially when the, pen, when the Beatitudes uh, were stated. The Beatitudes as were given by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel. So whether you pronounce it blessed or blessed, 
I think you know that you are a blessed individual as you are serving God today. Uh, some have translated their word, word other ways, for we uh, use uh, the word in uh, various settings, not just uh, spiritual uh, settings as we're talking about today. But um, some translations of the scriptures say happy. Happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. And some will, uh, another translation I think said something like, uh, joyful is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, etc. The wicked in verse one in the King James Version is, is um, uh, translated ungodly. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Notice the word stand and sit and walk. Those uh, verbs there that show basically the three posture positions that we most uh, uh, always are in throughout the day. We are either walking, we are either standing, or we are sitting. And he's saying that we are not to be doing it in the company or to be influenced in by the company of the sinners or the ungodly. It does not say that we cannot be in their company, for we know that to evangelize and to bring people to Jesus, we need to develop relationships with them. But the word counsel there, where do you get your advice? Where do you get your counsel? And certainly it's very plain here, we're not to get it from the wicked or the ungodly. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. I love those words, delight and meditate. Once again, delighting. I'm happy to be opening God's word and reading God's word and finding what it says to me. Meditating upon it day and night. Perhaps that says to me, or it says to me, that that's probably the uh, thing that dominates my thoughts more than anything else throughout the day. It's the last thing I think about as I rest my head on my pillow, and it's the first thing I think about when I rise in the morning. Verse 3, He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Again, I titled this section, The Fruit of of righteous or godly living. And we see the fruit, but we see the lack of fruit in ungodly or wicked living. These words describe a person living for God and are contrasted against the ungodly lifestyle. Many of us thought we were enjoying life before we became a Christian having a lot of fun, but then we experienced true joy and satisfaction when we came to know Christ in a personal way. Someone once said to a Christian, you dare not indulge in the pleasures of the world which give me a thrill. The Christian replied, 
It is not that I dare not do these things. Indeed, I have found something better, and I care not to do these things. I think a very, uh, a very good play on words. Just change one word there, and it changes the whole meaning of the sentence from dare to care. Verse 3, the phrase, they will prosper in all they do, does not mean immunity to failure or difficulties, nor does it guarantee health, wealth, and happiness. What the Bible means by prosperity is this. When we apply, when we apply God's wisdom, the fruit, that is the results or the byproducts, we bear will be good and will receive God's approval. Just as a tree soaks up water and bears luscious fruit, we also are to soak up God's word, producing actions and attitudes that honor God. To achieve anything worthwhile, we must have God's word in our hearts. Verse 4 mentions uh, the word uh, chaff. Uh, those of you who have uh, some farming or agricultural background are very familiar with that word. Chaff is the outer shell or husk that must be removed to get at the valuable kernels of grain inside. Chaff was removed by a process called threshing and winnowing. After the plants were cut, cut they were crushed and then the pieces were thrown into the air. Chaff is very light and is carried away by even the slightest wind, while the good grain falls back to the ground. So chaff is a symbol of a faithless life that drifts along without direction. Good grain is a symbol of a faithful life that can be used by God. Unlike grain, though, we can choose the direction that we take. Verses 5 and 6, they certainly talk about judgment for the wicked and the ungodly. We know there's a lot in the New Testament in regards to uh, our eternal reward or our eternity where we will spend it. But we can see here, even in the Old Testament, that they understood that the wicked or the ungodly could not stand blamelessly before God. But we, as the redeemed of Christ, can do so. And we that are bearing the fruits of godly living in conclusion, our world is filled with many different ways of living, many paths to choose, and many routes to take. The godly life is a way of living, a path made up of thousands of choices that add up to a life lived in response to the Word, capital W-O-R-D. Headed for an amazing destination, in the presence of God. The wicked life is also a way. It is a sum, S-U-M, of choices lived by rejecting God in our daily lives. Occasionally we are reminded, sometimes shockingly, the day-in, day-out choices we make are indeed really life and death choices. For those, the roads that we take, or which road that we take, determines the destination that we that it leads to. And have these life and death choices have been ours all along. And may we continue to choose life, choose life in Jesus Christ, the one true. Savior of mankind, the one who shed his blood 
for our, your sins and mine. Praise his name. I'm going to offer just a simple one or two line prayer. For I think uh, the, this little simple prayer in a simple sentence kind of summarizes all that we've said today. Father in heaven, thank you for your word and for the encouragement that it gives us. We're thankful for the blessed life that we have in you and that we continue to experience as we endeavor to meditate upon your law day and night and as we endeavor to love our fellow man, loving you and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And this would be the simple prayer that I pray. Help us to go after the right things here, so may we may go to the right place in the hereafter. Amen. And I thank you for listening.